lot of we are live here at Paul Veert's Garage. This is the place where all the magic happens week after week as the number 88 car gets ready to race here at Red River Co-op Speedway. Yeah, Paul's laughing over there. It's where all the magic happens. He's doing well this year, so there must be some magic happening here. You're watching the very first episode of the Inside Track here on the Manitoba Racing Network. Get ready. We've got lots of stuff going on here tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about cars. We're going to talk a little about counts. We've got lots to talk about. Here we go. All right, we are back and we are live here at Paul Veert's place. We've got a lot of stuff, great stuff going on here today. We've got a panel full of great speakers here that have lots to say, or at least that's what they tell me they have lots to say. So we're going to find out here in just a few seconds. We're going to start off first with the guy right here to my left. He drives the 1R car every week for the Modifieds, Rick Delane. Rick, thanks for coming out here tonight. Thank you. Are you planning on talking lots? Uh, I've been known to. The odd time. Yeah, yeah, a couple you times. speak your mind. I, I understand that. To his left, just right beside him, he drives the 24 Midwest Modified. And up until recently, he drove a 24 as well street stock. But I hear that's changed. James Wall, thanks for joining us. Thank you. What's going on with the street stock? I sold it. Two classes was, uh, was too much to handle. So I cut her back to one class and concentrate on one. Well, you know what? Somebody here is going to have something to say about that because he drives three cars. So there's really no reason for you not to handle driving two. I don't have a full-time mechanic. Oh. <laughs> <Touché. laughs> to his left, sitting beside him, he drives nothing except the pace truck from time to time. Blair Bodley's with us. He is the uh, general manager of Red River Co-op Speedway. Blair, you are going to be on the, under the hot seat probably the most tonight. That's all right. I'm sitting on a nice pack right now, so we're good. <laughs> and to his left, like I said, drives three race cars every single week at Red River Co-op Speedway. A uh, huge supporter of the track and what goes on there. Drives the 88 car and he's currently leading in one class, possibly in two more. Maybe after this weekend, he'll have three championships underneath his belt. The number 88 car of Paul Veert. Paul, thanks. thanks for joining us. We look forward to it. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> okay, guys, here's how the show is going to work for tonight. Plain and simple, we're going to ask you some topics on many different things and you guys are going to answer to the best of your ability. And hopefully you don't dodge too many questions bodily. All right. First thing I'm going to tell you guys, if you have any questions tonight and you would like to know what is going on from these guys, well, it's simple. Hashtag, go to Twitter, do this hashtag, simple, MB Inside Track, and you can have your question possibly read here tonight and answered by these four boys if we can get them under that gun and get them the proper answers. All right, so we've got that. But first, we're going to start off talking about the points championship at Red River Cup Speedway. Now, the points championship ends this weekend for majority of the classes here at Red River Co-op Speedway. We've already seen a couple classes already end because of the Thursday night Pure Stock Series championship that went on just a few days ago. But uh, on Friday and Saturday, we're going to end off the season and we've got lots of classes to talk about. So let's start off first with uh, some of the easier ones. We're going to talk about the super trucks first. Guys, it's not hard to figure out who's probably going to end up winning the super truck race, isn't it? Yeah, i got a pretty good idea who's going to win that one. Yeah, it's been uh, kind of runaway for Vernos this year, but uh, he earned it. Yeah, he's got a total, I do believe, of nine wins this year. Almost unprecedented, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good year. If you take a look at the board here, here are the top six guys in that class. Of course, the number five truck, Glenn Manning, is currently sitting in second place. He is about 34, 30, no, I'm not great at the math here. Let's 42. See. 42. Thanks, Paul, for jumping in there. 42 points back of the leader, Jamie Vernos. Does he have a hope of actually catching him? What would he need to have happen? They'd have to go back in time a little bit. You'd have to have <laughs> like, uh, something catastrophic in the, in the heat and uh, you can't Both nights. Both nights. Both yeah, nights. Yeah. 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 Chance that's that slim. And that's slim, right? Yeah. You don't see that very often. No. And it's, you know, really funny when you look at some of the other classes, it takes one bad night and it can really oh, pretty much ruin your season. We're going to talk a little bit about now about the lightning sprints. And if you take a look at that class, it was one night that set everything apart or kind of tore everything apart for Wally Butler and Amber Balkin. Amber Balkin, of course, flips on the front straightaway. They've won, I think, a total this year of six features and they are currently third in the point standings. And it was just because of that one night, they didn't get the race in the feature. And because of that, they're about 45, 50 points back of the, of the current leaders. Let's take a look at the point standings now for the Lightning Sprints. Now, guys, when you look at that Lightning Sprints class, it's a fairly close race compared to some of the other classes. But uh, they've done pretty well this year. Ed Bell, 
of course, hasn't had any wins this year, but he's only two points up on Dylan Sabatini, who also hasn't had any wins. But take a look at that. Butler and Balkan combined together this year for six victories in the Lightning Sprints. They're going to race one more time at Red River Co-op Speedway on the Saturday. Does Butler and Balkan have a chance of jumping back into this one? Yeah. With 13 points, I think if they had a... They need car counts, though, because you, yeah. you need lots of cars to gain points. Right, and you can see their, their yeah. competition fall back, right? But that's a, it's, it's a very close race for the top two in that class as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that one kind of shakes up as, uh, as the evening progresses on the Saturday. All right, we're going to switch something closer to your heart and your heart. Let's talk about the Midwest Modifieds. Now, Paul, you're uh, pretty close to the leader in this one. He's what... got, I think, an 18 or 19 point lead. And the way he's been running, I don't think we're going to catch him this year. Mind you, there's two races. Something could happen, but be unlikely. Yeah, and James, I mean, your comments on, on the Midwest Modifieds this season? Pretty much the same thing. To be up front and have a lead like that, you got to be running consistent. So you got to have something real bad happen for things uh, to change. Grant Hall is the current leader in that one, as you can see here. Grant has two wins this year. Paul Beard, of course, like I said, in second place with the 88 car. He has one win this year, but you're 19 points back according to these standings here. James, I have well, a win. What's that? I have a win. You have a win. Yes. Oh, your geez. Well, well, talk to our <laughs> graphics person here. We'll talk to that graphics person here tonight and we'll find out what's going on. Maybe that win was in dispute. <laughs> we'll find out. Maybe we'll have to give that win to you, Paul Veer, so he can get some more points to catch up to Grant Hall. But Paul, Grant Hall, he's been riding really well this year, and, and, and you guys have been back and forth on that. Uh, Consistently that track. strong. I think it's nice to see somebody else come up in that class and run at the front. And uh, I think it's good for the class that to get more guys involved next year. The count is down to 10 cars this year, 12 sometimes. We should be back at 18 or 20 for next year. Hopefully things get turned around. Now, this year you had the opportunity to drive a car, a brand new car, for the first time. You take it on the track that night. And uh, guess what? When the heat, when the feature, it looked like a pretty clean win for you guys. Yeah, it was a good deal. Um, we had some motor issues the week before, and that's part of what cost us the championship. In most cases, we dropped out of the feature running in second place, so that cost us the issue. But running a new car was great. It was it handled that really well. Having a mechanic like Steve set it up, basically identical to the other one. I knew what I had to going into the race, and it worked as per spec. Street stock class. Let's switch gears over to them for for the season. Shane Holden. Wow. Last year, rough season. I mean, it was Sean Tunis's year to win. He was just flying every single week. This week, we look, it's the opposite. Shane Holden, he's having all the luck. Sean Tunis uh, not having any luck whatsoever. And it's a complete 180 for the two drivers. And Holden is just flying in. He's going to get rid of that car at the end of the year, I, I do believe, because he's got it up for sale right now. Do you see him continuing on this path for the last two races of the season? I would say so. <laughs> he, hasn't, he hasn't shown anything otherwise yet. No. so He'll probably run conservative you know try to stay out of the out of the shit out of the garbage what size of lead does he have it's a pretty comfortable lead for him in his class here i'm just going to pull up the stats for you guys here so we can just talk 13, about this 14. but look at street stocks shane holden is currently leading this one with 529 15. points 13 points difference compared to number two place andy martins now if you take a look back barry hicks is uh currently sitting in uh third with 500 points but Shane Holden has been pretty solid throughout the course of the night, and he's been a guy that if you watch him week after week, he's starting off pretty far back in the pack, and in the feature, he finds his way to the front week after week. So the kid can drive. That's what people have to realize, too. When you are leading the points like that, uh, generally you're starting on the third or fourth row because your average is so high. So to continue to do that all year, uh, you've got to be running pretty strong. Something's going to have to really change to, to change the outcome of that, I would think. Now, we're going to switch gears now to the super stock class. And, Paul, well, it's we got a here. Yeah, we've got a slim lead there over uh, Mike Martin out of Steinbach. I think it's four or five points. And uh, have to just basically race clean in the heat and the feature to make the deal come true. Uh, it's two nights. Anything can happen. And uh, it's a wide open game this weekend. Super stock class has been kind of a rough class this year. Car counts haven't been that high. So has it been uh, pretty easy to coast to the top five every week? Uh, there's still you know, three or four guys that are ultra competitive every week. Um, it's unfortunate there's probably six or eight good super stocks lying around that just aren't being used. I'm not sure where the class is going uh, in the future. It'd be nice to keep the class going. I think there's a good group of guys, good core group of guys in that class, but we need to get another five or six cars to make it feasible. All right, here is the super stocks point standings right now. As you can see, Paul Veert currently with a four point 
Very slim lead on the 55 car of Mike Martin. Martin this year with four wins. He's done quite well in the winner's circle. Kevin Penner, though, not far behind. He's another guy that you've got to kind of watch out for. He's not too far behind, and with two races left, could he actually catch up? Oh, it's, it's wide open there. He said two nights, a big point swing can happen. So, And uh, those guys, you know, they obviously all win. So, you know, it's going to be who wins probably both nights. <laughs> now, Paul, have you won a championship here at Red River Co-op Speedway and anything else besides the Midwest Mods? Just Midwest Mods the last two years. Just last Finished second a couple times in Superstock, but never won it. So this is the year where you're hoping things turn We're hoping around, eh? things uh, keep straight and the drivers in the class mind their P's and Q's and allow us to race and don't turn into a demolition derby. And that could happen as well, couldn't it? Yeah, we tried that last Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <we're laughs> he's, I knew he was going to have some opinions tonight, so let's, uh, let's hear, hear some more. Okay, we're going to sh uh, shift gears now. We've talked about uh, just about almost all the classes, except, of course, we have mods and late models left for the Thursday night lineup. Modifieds, you're holding on by a slim lead, aren't you? Yeah, we were actually behind going into last week and uh, ended up winning the heat and feature. And uh, you get that bonus point for winning, so we got the lead back. Of course, Ward finished second and second, so you know, we're just going to keep it interesting here, I think, for the last two nights. It's, uh, it's going to come down to basically, I think, who wins the, wins the feature on uh, each night for that bonus point. Or, and it takes a lot of things, too. You know, if you get a, on the first night, if uh, one guy gets a good draw, one guy gets a bad draw, and you know, one starts on the pole in the heat, one starts eighth or something, you know, it's going to be a tough deal, but uh, that's why we race them, so we'll find out. And do we expect bigger car counts on this Friday and Saturday, seeing as though that there's not much racing going on elsewhere? Yeah, it'll probably be a little bit, but we'll probably maybe draw a couple cars from Emo and uh, maybe one or two from the Greenbush area, so we could have a few more. We have two solid good heats, I would, uh, I would assume, and, and a lot of the cars are fast. You know, the, anybody can, uh, you know, 75% of the field can win in that class, so. Kevin Sexton last year was in a heat race with uh, Ward Embry as well last year, and it ended up coming down right to the very last race, very last night. Do you see the same thing happening again this year? Like I said, only a two-point lead on Ward Embry as of right now. Yeah, it very well could be. You know, it, uh, Ward's fast, and uh, he's had a couple, he's had more wins than us, but he's had uh, uh, a couple DNFs. You know, if he smooths that out, then, uh, then it's going to be tough. And we really haven't had any DNFs, so that's kind of been, uh, we've been kind of consistent top five or every week with a throw in a couple wins, and, and uh, that's what we've done. So if uh, we both keep it straight on the track, it, it'll come down to a pretty good battle. And we, and we like racing against each other, and uh, we have pretty good races. We race quite a few different uh, places, and uh, we can race pretty hard, and, and she'll be able to keep the 10 on it, I think. One last class that we need to talk about tonight, and that is the late models, and that's another one, Paul. You're in competition for. Yeah, well, we're in second, but quite a ways back. Mike's around real consistent all year, Mike Balkan, and he's quite a bit up on me. We'd like to just stay and finish in second place there. We don't have a chance to win the deal, but I think uh, Mike's got the deal, but it should still be a good race this weekend. Uh, I think we're going to see a few late model travelers coming up this weekend for national points to make it a little more interesting. We could have 15 or 16 late models to make things really interesting. When it comes to those, those Americans coming in, if you take a look at some of the guys that have won this year, Mike Balkan's won a few times this year, Troy Schill, uh, Stefan Snare has won. Uh, those Americans actually throw a big twist into the pot when they come up here, isn't it? Absolutely. They take it real serious. Most of the names you mentioned race two, three nights a week, and that's kind of their whole vocation for the summer, and they come here to win, as does Dustin Strand put on a good show. So what do you have to do in order to catch up to Mike Balkan? Take the air out of his tires, I guess, before the race starts. <laughs> 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 All righty, Paul. Well, that wraps up the point championship, but we still got lots more to talk about. We are going to be switching topics now. Let's talk about car counts at Red River Cops. Speedway. Has not been a great year when you look at it. In fact, if you take a look at almost every single class at Red River Cops Speedway, barring one or two, 10 to 12 cars is what we see on a given night. Now, rewind the clock back two, three years, completely different story. 15 to 17 cars in some of the classes, if not more. What is going on when we look at the car counts at Red River Cops Speedway, guys? Is it a money thing? Guys just can't afford to come out, or is it money in terms of winning it? Um, it's definitely, it's very expensive. The economy is kind of bad everywhere right now. Um, it's, uh, like I was saying before, it's a, it's a cyclical thing. If it becomes a trend, then we really have to worry about it. Uh, not that we shouldn't be worrying about it now, but, uh, you know, it could rebound. I've seen a rebound in the past. I've seen it go up. I've seen it go down. 
Um, but the economy isn't that good, and uh, finding all that money that you need to do it is, uh, is tough right now. So, uh, When we talk about money, and we were talking before we started here, uh, I think it was, Paul, you were mentioning just to get out the, the front doors, or maybe it was you, Rick, it's 300 bucks. Whether or not you are winning or losing, it costs, it's going to cost you 300 bucks to pull a car out to get it to the track, you're not racing for a lot of money to begin with, so I guess you're going to need to either A, have deep pockets or sponsorship. Is that not the, the really the only way you can make this work? Yeah, and like businesses are struggling to survive right now, so it's hard to get sponsorship. I think money's part of the deal racing, but you know the old adage is almost like an hour per lap racing. The amount of time spent in these cars, like 10, 15 hours a week, a lot of guys with family stuff have other things going on in their life. It's hard to donate that much time to the car to be competitive. You come out in your race and you're finishing 10th or 12th, a lot of guys just fold up the tent and park the car and, and just come and watch instead. So there's a couple of different solutions to it. Now, we've also talked about cars. Of course, we always know of other drivers that have come out once in a while. They're not coming out all the time. How do we get those cars to come back to the speedway to increase those car counts? Is there anything we can do to entice those guys to come back? That's, a, that's an age-old question in uh, dirt track racing. It, uh, you know, the, the guys that are driving need to have fun coming out, too. Uh, it's part of the, the culture. The culture has to be fun. Uh, Maybe some of that's maybe lacking a little bit right now. Um, that could just be one aspect. There's cars sitting there that guys are watching in the stands or they're you know, checking it out again. I think if the culture is fun and you really have a good time coming out, you'll a lot of times find the way to find the money to make it happen, put the work in, whatever you need to do. So that, that could be part of the aspect uh, of it. Uh, how you change that exactly, you know, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but there's been some ups and downs in the last uh, few years at the track and uh, and some people have been there a long time so they may they're not having the fun they were but uh, I think it's starting to change a little bit again here so I think you'll see them come back again. I, I think Rick touched on something just there right now was that our track and I, I, I can't compare it with any other tracks but a lot of the guys at our track have been racing there for like a long period of time. Um, I, I think what we need to do is that we need to find a way to, to sort of cultivate like a new driver pool um, we need some young blood in there. We need more Gios and, and Emerys and, and whatnot. So when, when guys do stop racing or do get tired of it because they've got family obligations, I mean, it's, it's really tough nowadays, I think, to get to the racetrack simply because work obligations are different, family obligations are different, um, financial situations are different. Um, and that younger crowd doesn't have that, those restraints that maybe some of the older guys do. And you know what? It's just like anything. Guys just get tired of stuff over a period of time. But that's what we need to figure out, is that we need to figure out how to get more people back involved in this sport. Now, one I, thing that we haven't talked about is Americans coming here week after week. It doesn't happen as often as it used to. What do we do to get those okay, Americans part, come up? Part of this whole deal, though, part of this equation is having the drivers have fun, going back home and talking to their friends, saying, hey, it's fun again, come back out racing. And that's a big part of what we're lacking right now in Winnipeg. And the problem with the social media stuff, if the track is not right, whatever the case they got, the drivers are complaining about it and it feeds across, everybody sees that. If we can get everybody on a more positive page, I think they'll, they'll talk to other people and they can drag them out to come out racing. So you're saying it's not positive? There's people that are bad mouth in the speedway on a regular basis? It happens, and I think yeah. that's, that's a bad thing today. And, and they say going back to that it's social a new era. media. There, and it seems to be it's, a handful of guys in that, and it's not helping us out. It's, I mean, it's different. What, you, what, you, what you'll get is that you'll get four or five drivers that happen to be, I mean, social media, that's their whole life. Mm -hmm. is, is like that and when they st when they when they jump on there and start posting things they're speaking on behalf of the entire driver pool so the the hundred or however many drivers we've got at the racetrack you've got basically i'll say i'm not wrong saying like a half dozen to a dozen yeah, guys probably. they're yeah. basically the voice of everybody and they're not necessarily echoing the sentiments and i want to be clear some of the things they're saying are absolutely true but some of the thing i mean Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. And what people are saying on social media is one person's opinion. They're not speaking for, uh, for 100 guys. And I'd be lying if I said that's probably, I think that might be a, a, a small part of the problem right now. There are other issues that you have to, you know, you have to try and dissect when you're trying to figure out how to, how to get more people involved in that situation. But uh, social media can be your best friend or worst enemy. Having said that, though, to cut in here for a second, talking about the drivers and and uh, getting a new pool of drivers. I'm actually, in the, the million years that I've raced at the track, I'm actually real encouraged on the amount of young people that we do have <clears> racing. Uh, there's, a, there's a pretty good crop of, of young drivers, like under 20 years old. 
And to get an under 20 year old to even care about a car, I think is pretty spectacular, really. Like it's, it, you know, maybe a car on a, on a, on a game. But uh, there's actually a pretty good crop of young guys and uh, it's actually quite encouraging. When I first started racing in uh, 1985, the next youngest guy to me, I was 15, the next youngest guy to me was 25 to 30 years old. There was no young group of guys like they have now. And uh, like, like these guys actually have a pretty good culture, all those like the Tunises and, and Emery's and all those guys, like they got a, they're having a pretty fun time. And, and uh, when I started, that didn't exist. So there is some positives to what's happening right now. But when those older guys start retiring, getting out of the sport, for example, Mike Balkin, Paul, you're no spring chicken, sorry, but you know what I'm saying? In a yeah, few no. years, you may, change, you may change your mind <laughs> no, and decide I, not I to agree. be in. Right. That's three cars we lose. Right. You look at Mike, he may come out, so all of a sudden you lose four yep. or five cars, and it starts to make a big difference. So what do we have to do as a group to get more young people back into racing? Like, Do we need to look at guys that are young men and women that are 15 to 25 years old, put them in media cars and let them race around and get them addicted to the sport? I, I, I think anybody here, I mean, once you put somebody in a, in a race car, yeah. um, they're hooked. You know, if anybody has any, uh, any racing aspirations at all, I think the, the key thing is finding a way to put, people in a, to, to put people in the car and give them that experience because once they get that experience, they want more. That's where that rental program comes in. That's where that rental program comes in. <laughs> which is very controversial. <laughs> controversial rental it, program, it's... which is going to be another topic for another night, I think. But getting back to it, though, there okay, are but positives. Hang on, to hang it, on, right? hang on. Can we not? We already here. We okay. don't need to put it off to another night. <laughs> okay. So let's just let's just touch briefly on that. Because um, that I is mean, about the future drivers. We, we we do have a we have a rental car program there, as as you know, um, and it is somewhat controversial. And James, you'll jump in because I mean you race against them. Yeah. Um, what we've got is that we have a, a Derek Pollock at the racetrack has a rental car program and anybody, anybody, whether you've had racing experience or not, can jump in a race car and race with any of our, any of our drivers. I know for a fact that there's a handful of drivers that are driving cars now because of that program. Started there. And, and that started in that rental car program. The, the downside of it is, is that when you're racing with other guys, you're always got somebody in that car that is is just a raw raw rookie mm -hmm. some people like it some people don't but there needs to be a place um and this discussion can go on forever there there it, it does serve a purpose because it is, it is an opportunity for 350 dollars for a guy to jump in a race car and actually go and and and, and race with and i think it's good i think it's cars. it's bringing in it's more than than almost anybody else has done to bring that new driver pool in absolutely you know like there's other ways i guess to go about it trying to find uh, trying to find drivers. It's, this is not a stick and ball sport. You can't go for $12 and get a bat and, and you know, start playing a game. So it's very tough. Uh, I know in the past we've done things like take uh, the cars to a, uh, to a high school shops class and you know, give them all tickets or whatnot and give those kids an opportunity to see a race car up close. And if they're already in shops class, they've already got an interest in cars. So you have a late model or a modified that looks really you know, a wild looking car. And you bring it to a high school uh, or a junior high or whatever, I think that's one aspect that can really help fuel it, uh, maybe help those guys push them towards maybe come at least checking it out. You know, and, if you, and you get them out and then they're young, so then they, you know, they have girlfriends, they bring out the girls, and more girls, more guys, like it, all kinda, it all kinda starts coming together. And that's kind of what I think should maybe try again. So can the Speedway do more? Well, we, we have done, we, we've done it on a smaller scale. I know we've actually hit a couple of schools out in that, in that Selkirk area. And Rick's right, when, when, you, when you roll a car into their shop uh, and they all get to sit in it and climb over it. And, and then what really grabs them is that when you fire that thing up. And then when you actually hear a race car sitting there. And, uh, you know, we keep track of what we hand out. And tickets that you do give away, they do end up coming back to the, they do come back to the racetrack, which gets them engaged. But now you get you got to get to that that next step. I mean, we want we need fans too, but we need to put we need we need drivers for uh, for the cars. But Rick's right. I mean, you got to start you got to start right at that grassroots that grassroots level. Now I just want to throw kind of a twist into all of this. Super trucks last year created their own payout at the end of the season with a big purse for the for the winner. Would that help if if every class decided to jump on board, modified, said, you know what, we're going to get together, get some sponsors. We're going to race. We're going to have a circuit. Will that make a difference? It hasn't changed. The, it hasn't changed the count. Hasn't changed the numbers. Hasn't changed the count in the truck class. Yeah. Hasn't changed the truck count. Yeah. No. Yeah. The the 
And it goes against a lot of things that, that I don't really like that situation. There could be different opinions on all that deal when it comes to having your own association, and that's fine. And uh, I know the upper management at the track really loves it, but it, uh, uh, the downside to that is that already belongs to an association. We have a national association. And the only thing I, that I don't like about that is that, in a way, if all the classes had their own thing and started raising all their own money and, and built up all these pools, you know, and I, I'm involved in, in part of it too, so you know, I understand both sides. Um, it almost can make a track, not just ours, but any track, get a little lazy on, on ways that they think of to, to raise more money for the drivers or, or, uh, or, or how to promote the sport if everyone else is doing it for them. I know we all play a part, but I'm not a real fan of every group um, becoming a, their own fundraising group because, uh, like I said, there's still 9, 10, 11, 12 trucks. So had, all they've really done now, they're just kind of fueling. It's good for them, but they've just fueled their own class, and it hasn't really gone up or down. So I'm not sure if that's... It, it hasn't increased car counts at all. No. At all? No, no. What it no. did is, it, I mean, the, the 10 or 12 guys that are racing in that class, they just enjoyed a bigger payout. Um, there, there were new guys that came into that class, but I don't think it was because of the, uh, I don't think the payout had anything to do with it. Unfortunately, because, the guy that won last year is going to win it again this year. Well, so that, and, hasn't, that hasn't changed. And at the end of the day, I mean, what you're winning in that class, um, it doesn't pay for your race program anyways. And I'll be honest with you, if all nine classes built an association and tried to raise money, the, the pool isn't that big in this city to draw money from. It's pretty thin already. Uh, I've already crossed paths with when the late model guys were doing some of their deal and the truck guys, like we were crisscrossing some of the same people where we're getting money from. It's a small community, or right? Or your own sponsors. Yeah, or, or, or your own sponsors you to top it all off. After, so, you don't want a sponsor so, for yourself. Yeah, but then going back to the drivers themselves and having their businesses kicking isn't the way either. No, you're 100% right. And that's yeah. not the right answer either. No one really has what the answer is. Is it the number of classes that are too many that we can pare down to so it's easier to get money? Because you've got nine classes going off of that same almighty dollar, it's pretty hard. Yeah, it's, it's a tough age-old question. It is. Well, we're going to wrap that one up for the time being. We're going to take a quick break right now. Don't go too far now. If you have any questions tonight, what you can do is just get to us via Twitter. Now, use the hashtag MBInsideTrack, and you can have your question possibly read on tonight's show. And if it is, well, you could possibly win a gift certificate for Infernos. So stick around. We've got lots more coming up right after this brief message.